So good evening, everybody. A very warm welcome to all of you on behalf of Kushita, New Delhi. It is a great honor for me to welcome Venerable Sangye Kadrola, also known as Kathleen McDonald, to this evening uh, function today, this evening talk and a guided meditation. We are very fortunate, Venerable, to have you today with us. I know it's not happening physically, but um, some consolation that it's happening on Zoom. It's been years since I last saw you. <clears throat> Let me give a brief introduction to Venerable Sangye Katrola. Venerable was born in California and began studying Buddhism in Dharamsala, India in 1973. She became a Buddhist nun in Kopan Monastery, Nepal, in 1974, and took Bhikshuni ordination in 1988. Over the years, she has studied with various teachers, including Lama Zupa Rinpoche, Lama Tuptan Yeshe, and His Holiness the Dalai Lama. At the request of her teachers, Venerable Sangha Kadro began teaching in 1979. And since then, has taught in many countries around the world. She is also the author of How to Meditate and Awakening the Kind Heart. These books have been published by Wisdom. So anyone who is interested um, can have a look at her books. But there, if there is one book that I'd like to recommend to everyone, this is called How to Meditate. I think it's a classic text on meditation, very simply uh, explained. She completed the master's program from Institute Lama Songkhapa in Italy in the year 2013 and is currently residing in Sravasti Abbey and is also teaching online to most of the people in the world today. So thank you very much, um, Sangila, for accepting to teach today for our center. So I request you to kindly give your talk and lead the guided meditation. <clears throat> thank you, Manuka. Thank you very much. And I am very happy that I have this opportunity to give this talk today. I have many fond memories of uh, staying in Tushita, Delhi at Padmini Enclave um, and sometimes teaching there, but also just sometimes staying there. It's a nice place to stay when you're traveling in and out of Delhi. And, um, but I haven't been back for many years and I understand the center has also been closed for quite a while due to COVID. So it's wonderful that the center is open again, functioning again. And I'm very happy to have this chance to again connect with uh, the people of Tushita Center. And I'm also very happy about the topic I was asked to talk about today, um, kindness and compassion. This is one of my favorite topics, and it's actually something I had difficulty with um, much of my life. When I was when I was young, when I was a child, I I was often angry, and I had difficulty getting along with um, other people, and I was very unhappy. And then when I started learning Buddhism, I was fortunate that I started learning Buddhism pretty young. I was about 20, how old was I? I was 21 years old when I went, I went to India because I had been reading books about Indian gurus and I just felt so inspired. I just felt like, wow, India is a place where there's lots of spiritual teachers and I wanna find a spiritual teacher and 
uh, follow a spiritual path. So I made my way to India. I went to Dharmasala. That's the very first place I went and started meeting the Tibetans and started learning Buddhism. And then my whole life changed from then on. And so, uh, yeah, one of the things I love about Buddhism, one of the things that really attracted me to Buddhism was the teachings on compassion. And most religions, most uh, spiritual traditions have, you know, they talk about compassion and kindness. But I found in Buddhism a really deep kind of compassion for all sentient beings. I was brought up a Catholic, and so in Catholicism and Christianity, um, you know, there's respect for other human beings. We're not supposed to kill human beings, but there's no mention about animals and insects. And even when I was a teenager, and I and I started thinking about where our food comes from, where meat comes from. And I, I just thought, oh, I can't I can't eat meat because animals have to be killed in order to have meat. And I just felt that's wrong. And so in those days, there weren't many people in the West who were vegetarian, but <clears throat> I decided to become a vegetarian because I just felt it was wrong to kill animals for meat. And so um, that's one of the things I really loved about Buddhism, that they teach compassion for all living beings, including animals and birds and fish and even insects. <laughs> I remember when I first <clears throat> when I first went to Dharamsala, that was in 1973, almost 50 years ago. <laughs> you can see how old I am. Um, and and I was studying Buddhism at the Tibetan library, and the teacher at that time was um, <clears throat> Geshe Ngoan Darge, wonderful teacher. So he was my first teacher, and also the one that I took refuge with, and that's where I got my name. My name, Sangha Kadro, was given by Geshe Ngoan Darge when I took refuge. And um, so I I was staying in a in a room near the Tibetan library, and. One day I was I was just out for a walk and I saw this teacher, Geshe Ngoan Darge. He was walking around the library, like Tibetans do this practice, they call korwa, which means walking in a in a, a clockwise direction around holy objects, like stupas and temples and so on. So that's actually a practice that they do, creating merit and purifying. So he was walking around the uh, library building and I, I was kind of surprised to see him outside of his room you know taking a walk because usually he was in his room studying and doing prayers so I kind of stopped and watched him and then and then I saw at some point he stopped and he bent down and there was some kind of insect on the ground I don't know a worm or uh, some small insect so he stopped and he very gently picked up this insect from the from the pavement and he put it over on the side on the grass. And that action was just so I was just so amazed. I don't know if I'd ever seen anybody do that before. And this was somebody who was a highly respected Lama. You know, he was a teacher, he was a Geshe, he, he was like a professor. And, you know, when we went into class, everybody prostrated to him and showed him a lot of respect. And so to me, to see such a highly, highly respected person show interest, show kindness towards a little insect was just mind blowing. <laughs> but this is what Tibetans do. You may have seen it as well, you know, that they 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 notice little insects and they try to protect them save them from being stepped on or run over or drowned or whatever and so yeah that really made a big impression on me and i was really happy to see that and i really felt yes this is the right way to be to regard all living beings with um with concern with kindness, with compassion. I mean, it's difficult to save every single person and 
animal and insect on the planet, but we at least try our best. We try what we can. So yeah, so this that this aspect of compassion is particularly emphasized in Buddhism, and it's one of the reasons that I decided to become a Buddhist and become a nun um, because I just wanted to devote myself to this path. And then also when I was studying, going to classes at, at the Tibetan library and I learned about bodhicitta. <clears throat> bodhicitta means the mind of enlightenment. And it's, I'm just saying this in case some of you haven't heard, but bodhicitta is the aspiration to become enlightened, to become a Buddha, just like our teacher, the Buddha, um, with, the, with the wish to benefit all living beings. So with this, with this feeling, I want to help all sentient beings. How can I help them? Oh, the best way I can help them is to develop my own abilities, my wisdom, my compassion, my qualities, so that I can be more and more beneficial for others. So that's the meaning of bodhicitta. So when I learned about that, I thought, I can't imagine anything more wonderful to do with my life than to work for enlightenment. And so, yeah, that was one of the main factors that inspired me to become a Buddhist and become a nun. And now, almost 50 years later, I'm still here and still doing it. And yeah, it's, it's wonderful. It's just a wonderful um, religion. But these teachings about love and compassion that are found in Buddhism, you don't have to be a Buddhist to understand them and to practice them. I mean, they're universal. They're, they're universal qualities that everyone can relate to. And so that's another reason I like to talk about love and compassion, because I think it's, it's good for everybody, whether you want to become a Buddhist or not. You don't have to become a Buddhist. You don't have to take on the whole Buddhist path the teachings, practices, and so on. But if if you feel inspired to have more love and compassion, then then go for it. You know, you can take those teachings from Buddhism and and use them in your life. Um, so I'm going to talk about some ways that we can have more kindness and more compassion in our lives. And um, one way of doing this is to learn and reflect on what are called the four immeasurables or the four immeasurable thoughts. And um, these, you may have encountered these, there's one prayer that we often do where we, there's like one line for each of the four immeasurable thoughts where it says, may all beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all beings be free of suffering and the causes of suffering. May all beings never be separated from the happiness that is free from suffering. May all beings abide in equanimity, free of attachment and anger that hold some close and keep others distant. So it's relatively short. It's a short prayer, so you can easily memorize it, learn it, and then recite it. And, you know, it's a really good thing to do in the morning, especially when you first get up and before you go to work, before you uh, start doing whatever you do during the day to, um, you know, recite or, or read this prayer and then spend a little bit of time reflecting on the meaning and really try to cultivate these thoughts. So in that way, before you start working and interacting with people and the world, then you, you do it with uh, a sense of kindness and compassion, good feelings in your heart. So I'm going to talk about these four measurables briefly. I wrote a book about it. <laughs> so um, yeah, if you want to know more, there's that book. There's, there's also many books on this topic, especially by His Holiness. He talks a lot about compassion and love and, and so on. So I'm sure you're familiar with his teachings and his books. So there's many resources for learning more about compassion. So I'll talk for a while and then I'll, I'll stop and um, we can have some Q&A. And then before we end, we'll do some meditation. 
So the first of the four immeasurables, and the reason they're called immeasurables is because uh, the goal is to generate these thoughts or feelings for all living beings, for every being without exception. And Buddhism says there's so many living beings, they cannot be counted. They are immeasurable. But of course, we can't do that right away from the beginning. In the beginning, we'll be able to feel love and compassion for you know, a limited number of people. But gradually over time, we can increase this feeling and come to feel it for more and more people and more and more living beings. So it's a gradual process and we have to be patient with ourselves. Um, so the first of the four is called uh, love or loving kindness. I, I prefer using the word loving kindness because the word love, you know, often it's used for romantic love or sexual feelings and, and there it can get kind of sticky and messy. But loving kindness kind of focuses more on the real meaning of, of this attitude. It could also be called friendliness, you know, just being warm and friendly to other beings. The, the Pali term is metta. That's what it's called in the Theravada tradition. And in Sanskrit, it's metri, like the, the name of the future Buddha is Maitreya. Maitreya is the Buddha that will come in the future to again teach the Dharma. And his name is ba based on this, um, this term, uh, uh, Maitri. Uh, in Tibetan, it's Jampa. Um, yeah, so anyway, so loving kindness is expressed by the, the first line in that prayer I read, which says, may all beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. So that's how love is explained in Buddhism. It's the wish for others to be happy, but also ourselves. We need to have loving kindness for ourselves. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't work if we just feel love for others, but then have hatred for ourselves. <laughs> so we shouldn't have hatred or anger towards any living being, including oneself. That's really kind of unpleasant, painful. Um, so the kind of love we're trying to cultivate in, in Buddhism is unconditional love. So all of us do feel love. It's a natural quality in our minds. We have love for our parents or uh, partners, children, pets friends and so on. So we do have these positive feelings for some people, some beings. But often our love is conditional. It's almost like a contract, not that we verbalize this or put it in writing, but just mentally, we, we feel, you know, I will love you as long as you love me and, and are nice to me and do what I want you to do. <laughs> and so as long as the other person complies with our wishes and expectations, then we treat them well, we're nice to them, we love them. But if they go against our wishes, you know, if they do what we don't want them to do, or they don't do what we do want them to do, or they treat us badly, or whatever, then, then you know, we, we might think, well, I'm not, I don't love you anymore, I'm not going to be nice to you anymore, and we may even have anger and hatred. So that's the meaning of conditional love, love that's conditional, depending on the other person's behavior. Um, so that's not the most ideal form of love. The most ideal form of love is unconditional, meaning no strings attached. There's no contract. No matter what the person does, what they say, how they behave, how they treat us, we continue loving them. Now that's very hard to do, of course, but we probably do have experience of that, especially I think parents, <laughs> probably some of you are parents and you love your children so much, no matter what they do, you know, you might get angry at them, you might feel angry at them, but you quickly go get over that anger and continue loving them because 
you know, you brought them into the world and you feel this sense of responsibility for them and they're so dear and precious to you that you, you're able to forgive them for whatever they do. So you, there's stories, for example, of criminals, you know, people who've done awful things, murder and rape and, uh, and, and they're in prison for the crimes that they committed. But usually their mother still loves them, their mother still cares for them, goes to visit them, sends them presents, knits them sweaters, and so on and so forth. So uh, the, the love of a mother, usually, most of the time, is that kind of love, unconditional love. Um, so you may have experienced that yourself, or witnessed it, heard about it in other people. So that's the kind of love that we try to develop for other beings. It's hard, but it's not impossible. It is possible. It is doable. Buddhism has a lot of methods, a lot of tools for how to overcome anger and hatred and uh, criticalness, judgmentalness. Those are the kind of things that get in the way of, of feeling that kind of love. And so, you know, even if we do get angry at somebody because they hurt us or they did something awful, we can overcome those feelings of anger. It is possible. It does take some effort, it does take some work, but it's definitely possible. So, so, so in, in Tibetan Buddhism, there's a couple of ways that we can work on cultivating this feeling of love. We already have it. We do feel it for some people, but the idea is to try to feel it for more and more people, gradually expand this feeling of love to more and more people and living beings. So one, of, one way of doing that is just understanding that everyone wants to be happy. That's kind of a simple idea, but it's very profound if we think about it. <clears throat> so we ourselves want happiness and happiness here doesn't necessarily mean feeling really whoopee, you know, kind of excited feeling, but it can be as simple as having food when we're hungry, you know, when our stomach is hung is empty and we feel hungry, we want something to eat. So, you know, that's universal. Every person, every being wants to have their stomach full and not be hungry and they want to be warm when it's cold and they want to be cool when it's hot and they want to be comfortable you know you see even dogs in the street in india they try to find you know something comfortable to lie on when they have to sleep <clears throat> and um <clears throat> and also we we want to be safe we don't want to be <clears throat> harmed by others, um, threatened by others, and so on. So we want to be treated well. So that's, you know, this is like really basic needs, basic um, wishes that everyone, every person and every being, even animals and insects, you know, like an insect, um, you know, it might be walking along on a table or on a on the floor just kind of going along but if we move towards it we put our finger towards it then you can see it starts rushing you know it gets like scared and tries to run away tries to find a, a place to to protect itself so that shows even small insects you know they don't want to be harmed they want to stay alive they want to be protected yeah. So just getting more familiar with that, that every living beings, every being wants happiness, wants their needs fulfilled, wants to not be harmed, to not suffer, to not die, and so on. So just getting familiar with that is a very helpful way of softening our heart and opening our heart and feeling more kindness and the wish to help, the wish to help others as much as we can. <clears throat> so we have, uh, there's something that's sometimes called the golden rule. Um, and I used to think that was exclusive to Christianity, but apparently it's universal. Every religion 
has some kind of idea like the golden rule, which basically is, um, just to put it in simple words, is treat others the way you want to be treated. In other words, you know, you want to be treated nicely. Uh, you want to have your needs fulfilled. You don't want to be harmed, to be mistreated, misrespected, and so on. So that's how you feel. Well, everyone else feels that way too. And so treat others in that same way that you want to be treated. So, you know, it's expressed in different words in different ways, but it's basically the same idea. So that's, that's a universal idea that's found in most, if not all religions. And um, <clears throat> so just making that um, part of your way of thinking and way of relating with other people. Yeah, just treat others the way you want to be treated, which is nice. <laughs> you want to be treated well, well, treat others that way. And sometimes we may think, but why should I? <laughs> Especially, you know, there's somebody who's behaving badly, doing awful things, making problems for others. We think, why should I be nice to that person? They're not nice. But it's one thing that's really helpful is to recognize that if if we have negative feelings like anger and hatred and the wish to harm, that those kind of feelings are actually really painful. If you look at your own mind, if you look at your own heart and ask yourself, how do I feel when I'm angry? How do I feel when I hate somebody? Is that a good feeling? Does that make me happy? I think you'll probably recognize, no, it's not a nice feeling to have. It's painful. It's ugly. I like to think of um, the analogy of holding hot coals in your hand. Not that I've ever tried doing that, but you can imagine how horrible that would be, how painful that would be to hold on to hot coals. It's like, oh, this is painful. Well, you don't have to hold on to them. You can let go of them. You can drop them. So it's kind of similar with anger and hatred that you know, if we hold on to those feelings in our mind or in our heart, it's so painful. Yeah. So that's helpful to look at, to explore on your own. How do I feel when I'm angry, when I'm hateful, when I when I have harmful thoughts, wanting to harm others or wanting someone to be harmed? Do I feel good? Do I feel happy? Is that good for me? And you'll probably, hopefully, <laughs> you'll see, no, those are not good feelings. They're, they're, harm, they're painful. I don't want to feel that way. And the, and the good thing is you don't have to feel that way. You can let go of those thoughts and those feelings. You can, you know, throw them away, put them in the rubbish and replace them with positive thoughts and feelings such as caring about others, wanting to help others, wanting to treat others with kindness. So sometimes it takes a lot of time, and you know, like especially if somebody has harmed you, you know, if you have received harm from another person, then naturally, you know, we feel hurt, we feel angry, and we may have thoughts of wanting to take revenge, wanting to hurt that person in return. And, um, but again, you know, if you look at that, do you really want to be that way? Is that the kind of person you want to be? Is that going to bring you happiness? And if you answer no to those questions, then you can do something about it. There are ways of um, letting go of those feelings and developing forgiveness. And sometimes it may take a long time. It may take years to get to that point. But at least if you have the wish to do that, if you if you feel, yes, I do want to learn to forgive, I do want to get beyond these feelings of anger and hatred, you definitely can do it. I can guarantee <laughs> my, it's been in my experience in my life, I've been able to do that. 
and and I know it is possible. So if you, you know you do have to see the value of doing that and want to do that. And also, I, I heard like in America they've done studies on um, the state of mind of kindness and compassion. So they you know they do research and they find that it it has a lot of benefits for for yourself if you have these attitudes. It's good for your health. You'll have less stress and probably live longer. Hatred is actually bad for us. <laughs> it's actually bad for our health. Um, whereas kindness is good for our health. And also we'll have, like mentally, we'll feel better about ourselves. We'll feel more useful, have more of a sense of purpose in life feel more connected with other people, less lonely. A lot of people suffer from loneliness. And, um, you know, even living in a city with millions of people around you, you can still feel lonely. So having more kindness and more compassion and bringing that into your interactions with others is a good cure for loneliness. Also, another wonderful benefit of kindness is that if we act with kindness, we do acts of kindness, then this inspires other people to do acts of kindness. So they say kindness is contagious. <laughs> and you can probably see that in your experience. If you see somebody doing something kind, like maybe giving a little bit of food to a hungry animal, or helping an elderly person who's having difficulty walking along or carrying their um, groceries or whatever. So if you see somebody helping, showing kindness to another person, to another being, you probably feel, oh, that's beautiful. That's a nice thing to do. And then you yourself might do an act of kindness. So that's what happens. It doesn't happen maybe to everybody, but it happens to a lot of people. So then when you think about that, one person doing an act of kindness, other people see that or hear about that, and then they do an act of kindness, and then it has a ripple effect. So then more and more people will be inspired to do acts of kindness. And that's good for the ones who are acting in a kind way. But it's also good for the, the recipients, the ones who are receiving those acts of kindness. So that's wonderful. <laughs> yeah. And then another um, way that we can uh, generate more kindness, uh, this is in the Tibetan tradition, but it's based on the Buddhist teachings. And that is to contemplate that we ourselves have received a enormous amount of kindness from others. In fact, every day of our life, we receive kindness from others. And um, for example, the food that we eat, right? We, we need food to survive. Without food, we die. So do you ever think about where your food comes from? You know, often we just eat kind of mindlessly and maybe with an attitude of complacency like yeah I have money and I can have food and you know but where does that food come from you know so it's good to think about the farmers most of the food uh, starts with farmers who, who have quite a hard life it's not easy growing crops vegetables and, and grains and so forth so it takes a lot of time a lot of energy and often they have to work outside with very difficult conditions heat rain in some places snow and maybe insects biting them and and so on so it's like take months takes months of work to grow the wheat that we you have you know for bread rice, um, vegetables, and so on and so forth. Yeah, so every day we are dependent on the farmers and um, the other people involved in the process, like um, picking the food, bringing it to the market, or bringing it to the factory, people working in the market, people working in the factory, making it into bread and noodles and, and so on. 
So there's like so many people working very hard to provide us with the food that we eat every day. So that's just one example of how we are dependent on the kindness of others. And then even water, um, you know, most people have water just coming out of their tap anytime they turn it on. That's not always the case with every, everybody in every place. Sometimes people have great difficulty getting water. But if we do have clean, healthy water when, when we want it, that's also due to the kindness of many people and many beings who have constructed the um, the systems that bring water from wherever it came from, like from the mountains um, or from deep under the earth, um, for reservoirs, lakes, and so on, bringing it to where we live and also making sure that it's clean. Many cities, you know, um, treat the water to remove the contaminants so that it's healthy and clean for us. So even just water, which is so kind of ordinary in a way, and yet it's so precious because without water, we can't live more than a few days. So food, water, clothes, the clothes that we wear, the house that we live in, um, the vehicles we drive or travel in and, and so on. So in every way, in every aspect of our life, all the things we use, all the things we enjoy, um, these are all coming from others, from other people, other beings. So that's good to think about that. And if you do it, again, it opens up your heart to others with a sense of appreciation, gratitude. And then naturally that gives rise to the feeling of wanting to treat them well, wanting to be kind to them, to cherish them. So those are just some simple ideas on how we can have more kindness towards others. So that's the first of the four immeasurables, loving kindness. The second one is compassion, karuna in Sanskrit, ningje in Tibetan. And the, the prayer of the four measurables, uh, the second line of the prayer expresses compassion by saying, may all beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. So compassion and love are very similar, but slightly different. And um, love, as I said, is more focused on others wish for happiness, understanding that they want to be happy, they want their needs fulfilled, they want to be treated well, and appreciating that and then trying to be kind to them so that they are happy. And then compassion is explained as the wish for others to not suffer. So it's based on understanding that nobody wants to suffer just as we do. We don't want pain. We don't want to be mistreated. We don't want bad things happening to us. Yeah. So we don't want suffering, problems, difficulties, pain, and so forth. So just as we feel that way, so does everybody else. Every person, every living being, every being who has mind, who has awareness, who has consciousness, has that attitude in their mind. Again, even animals and insects, you can see, they run away from danger. You know, if you, even if you scream at them, you don't even hit them, but you just scream or yell or threaten them, they get scared and run away. So that shows they don't want suffering. They don't want to be harmed. They don't want any pain. Um, so this is, a, again, a universal feeling, a universal attitude that everyone has deep down in their mind, in their heart, not wanting to suffer. So compassion is based on that, based on recognizing that nobody wants to suffer. And then, um, you know, appreciating that in the sense of, I don't want to make others suffer. I don't want to cause suffering to anybody. So it's actually, compassion is actually the basis of ethics in Buddhism. In Buddhism, ethics or morality 
is um, living our life in such a way that we don't harm others. We refrain from harming others in various ways, killing or stealing their things, speaking harshly to them or lying to them. So, you know, just becoming aware of the different ways that we can harm others and making the conscious deliberate effort to not do those things, to not harm others. Again, just as we don't want to be harmed, we don't want anyone hurting us, killing us, or physically harming us, or lying to us, or being nasty to us. Just as we don't want that, nobody else does either. And so we we make this um, kind of determination to not behave that way, to not treat anybody that way. So that's basically, that's based on compassion, understanding nobody wants to suffer. Nobody wants to be harmed. But compassion goes beyond that. It goes, it's more than just not harming others. It's also trying to help others when they are suffering. So when we become aware that another person or another being is experiencing suffering, whether it's physical suffering or it's emotional suffering, we can see their, you know, tears coming from their eyes. Um, so when we notice that somebody is suffering and we, we, we feel concerned, we, we feel the wish for them to not suffer. And if we are in a position to do something about that, you know, to reach out and do what we can to relieve their suffering, then we do that. And even if we, maybe we can't do that, like if we're watching television and we see somebody crying on the TV, well, we can't kind of <laughs> reach out and help that person, but we at least feel the wish for them to be free of suffering. And, you know, in some cases, you know, try to seek help for that person. If we can't help them ourselves, look for ways in which others can help them. So that's basically what compassion is about. Compassion is wishing others to not suffer, doing what we can to relieve their suffering. Um, and even if we can't, we, you know, we can't in every case relieve another person's suffering, but at least wishing them to not suffer. So that's the meaning of compassion. And again, it's something we do feel. We all do have compassion. We feel it most obviously with loved ones. So we all have family members. We have our parents, our siblings. And some of you are married. You have your partner. You have children. Some people have pets. So with this circle of people and beings that you know we care about when any of them is suffering physically or emotionally we are concerned we feel concern and want to help them okay so whenever we have that kind of feeling that's the feeling of compassion so we do have that experience and we also may sometimes feel it for strangers you know, when you're out somewhere and you see somebody, you know, injured or falling down or having difficulty struggling. So again, you may feel, oh, I want to help that person. Okay. So we sometimes feel it for strangers. When it comes to um, negative people, like people who do harmful things, then then it's more difficult to feel compassion and instead of compassion we may feel the opposite we may feel we may want them to suffer we may feel you should suffer you deserve to suffer may you suffer so we may have that kind of thought and feeling coming up in our mind and that's the opposite of compassion that's like cruelty um and that's quite negative so again you know it's good to look at that kind of thought that kind of feeling and ask yourself is this the way i want to be is this good for me is this you know making me happy or is it making me suffer and you hopefully you'll we recognize that kind of thought that kind of feeling isn't the way you want to be 
but we can change it. You know, just because that thought or feeling comes up in our mind doesn't mean that we have to go along with it. We have to, you know, feed it and let it, you know, be in our mind and grow in our mind. We can change it. There are ways we can change that kind of thought and that feeling. And again, like I was saying before, if you, you know, you can think about that person that you're angry at and you may wish them to suffer and then think about that's just another person like me, another human being like like me. And deep down inside, they're just trying to be happy. They just want to be happy and they want to be free from suffering. And then it's good to try to understand why the person is behaving that way. Why are they doing those harmful things? Yeah. So one reason is often because they themselves have received a lot of harm. You know, there's like, I, I know people, I, I do a little bit of work with people in prison um, and and also there's a number of organizations that, that also try to help people in prison because they often, you know, they're, they're in prison and they're really miserable and they hear about meditation and they want to learn about meditation. So there's a lot of organizations that teach meditation and teach dharma to people in prisons and so anyway many of the people in prison like in america it's awful the number of people who are in prison is just outrageous but many of those people if you look into their lives especially when they were young when they were children they had horrible lives horrible experiences they were abused physically abused sexually abused um, and sometimes their parents were uh, taking drugs, alcohol. So they grew up in really, really difficult circumstances, um, not healthy, not, not nurturing and positive at all. And so that's often the case, you know, when a person experiences a lot of difficulties and problems and they don't receive enough love and compassion and healthy nurturing from parents and so on, then then that really messes them up and they get into crime, they get into doing awful things. So that's often the case. So if you try to explore that person's uh, life and see what, what happened to them in their life, you'll probably find bad things, bad things happen to them. And so the, the way they're behaving is often just an, a result of the way they they were treated. So that can really help you to change your attitude towards such people and your, your mind becomes more soft. My, my screen has just become fuzzy. So let me see if I can fix that. Yeah, so it can help your mind to become more soft towards this person, not so angry and hateful. And then gradually, it's easier to feel compassion for them. So yeah, compassion is a really beautiful state of mind. And if we can cultivate it, and again, you know, the Dalai Lama talks a lot about compassion. Every time he gives a talk, in fact, <laughs> he'll say something about compassion and in just his way of being. Yeah, I mean, you can just see it, his, his face, the expression on his face, you know, it's always just so loving and kind and compassionate and, and uh, hard to imagine he ever gets angry at anybody. Maybe it happens. <laughs> sometimes. He does say that. He says sometimes he gets angry, but it doesn't last very long. But yeah, his just whole way of being all the time is, is so compassionate. So it's good to have examples like that of somebody who is compassionate and, you know, even towards those who do awful things like, you know, the Chinese who have done such terrible things to Tibet and Tibetan people, you know, his way of dealing with them is compassionate. You know, he doesn't have anger and hatred. He doesn't sort of rage against how awful they are and how, you know, we should punish them and this and that and so on, you know, he actually cares about them. <laughs> so that's really extraordinary. So yeah, it takes time, it does take effort to generate compassion, but it's worthwhile. Because again, 
studies show that if we can be more compassionate, we will benefit. So not only do others benefit from our compassion, we ourselves will benefit too. We'll be happier, healthier, and uh, we'll have fewer problems in our relationships with others. We'll have more peace of mind and so on. But one thing I want to say is, and you may have heard this before, um, being compassionate doesn't mean um, always letting people do whatever they want. Now, this is a mis misunderstanding people have that um, if someone is behaving destructively, harmfully, and uh, that you, you, you know, if you think, oh, well, I have to be compassionate to them and just kind of leave them be and let them do whatever they want. That's not the meaning of compassion. Um, if some, because if you think about it, if somebody's behaving harmfully and destructively, that's bad for others. It may also be bad for ourselves if they're behaving that way to us, but it's also bad for them because they're creating bad karma. And they also, you know, if they're committing crimes, then they may end up in prison. So it's not good to let people behave that way. So if we can, if there is a way we can stop them uh, from doing those harmful things, then we should. We should, you know, do what we can to stop those harmful actions. And if we can't do it ourselves, then find help for them. You know, find someone who can deal with that person and stop those harmful behaviors. So the point is with compassion is, you know, when we do those things to stop somebody's harmful behavior, we do it with a, with a feeling of compassion and not anger and hatred and, you know, wanting to make them suffer. So it's difficult to do, right? But the more we familiarize ourselves with compassion and loving kindness, the easier it will be to have that in our heart and then deal with that person to um, try to stop them from their harmful behavior. Yeah, so the Dalai Lama talks about that. He says we need to be very firm with people, not let them get away with negative actions, harmful actions, but we do this with loving kindness and compassion in our hearts. Okay, so I'll just quickly talk about the last two of the four measurables. Number three is called joy. Uh, or another term is sympathetic joy or empathetic joy. So what it means is sharing in the happiness of others. Um, so what that means is when somebody else is happy, is uh, enjoying good experiences, good fortune and so on, we share in that happiness. We feel happy for them. We feel happy with them. And again, this is something we do feel naturally, especially with our loved ones. You know, when something good is happening with them, or we see that they are happy, they are enjoying themselves, we feel happy too. So it's like sharing the happiness of others. But it doesn't always happen. And the main um, what is it? An enemy or, or uh, opposite state of mind to this is jealousy, envy. Um, so I think we all feel that way sometimes. <laughs> Instead of enjoying somebody else's happiness or good fortune, we feel envious. We feel, why do they have to have that nice experience or buy that new car or, you know, get that promotion in their job? Why do they have to have it? Not me. I want that. I want that. So and that's a really painful state of mind. Um, it's very self-centered. It's all about me. I want that, not them. So there's self-centeredness. There's also attachment, desire. We want what that other person has. And, um, and then there's anger, like anger, hatred. We're like really angry. We can't bear it. We can't stand it that that person has that good experience 
and the I don't. So that's what jealousy is in, is is all about. It's very painful. It's very ugly, and probably everybody does experience it at least sometimes. Um, so again, if we can recognize that that state of mind is painful, it's really painful to hold on to, and we don't have to. We can let go of it. We can change it. And this state of mind, joy, is the total opposite. So it's like the remedy to um, to envy, to jealousy. Um, and so when we find ourselves feeling envious or feeling jealous, what what's helpful is again to think, well, this that person is just like me. They want to be happy. They don't want to suffer. And you know why can't I be happy for them? They're they're having some some nice experience. So you know, isn't that what I want? When when we have loving kindness, we want others to be happy. So why should we feel resentful when somebody is happy? <laughs> it doesn't make sense. <laughs> yeah, so try to renew your feeling of loving kindness and think, yes, I do want that person to be happy. May they be happy, and then. And then even if it's not the way you actually feel, but it's good to try to feel this way, to think, I am happy that they are happy. How wonderful that they are happy. How wonderful that they're having this, this nice experience. So we might have to sort of grit our teeth, you know, and force ourselves to think that way, to feel that way initially. But if we try to do it, we'll probably notice this actually feels better. This is a more wholesome and more positive way of thinking, a more positive way of feeling. Yeah, I want to be like this more. And so then gradually it will start to come more naturally, more spontaneously, rather than jealousy. So initially we may have to, you know, put a lot of effort into feeling this way, but eventually it'll start to arise naturally by yourself because it just feels better. It feels more right, right way to be. And then just quickly, the last of the four measurables is equanimity. So equanimity means that whatever positive thoughts, feelings, attitudes we develop, we try to develop them for everyone equally. And it's not the way we normally are <laughs> normal human um, mind and feelings are that we we usually separate people into different groups so there's those that we like you know people we really like love care about want them to be happy and treat them well and so on and then there's another group of people we don't like we feel, um, I don't like that person. We may feel uh, judgmental, critical. We don't like the way they are, the way they behave, uh, things about them and so on. And so that's another group of people, the ones we dislike. And then probably the majority of people and the majority of beings in the world fall into the third group, the third category of Sometimes they're called strangers, but it's more accurate to th think of them as just people towards whom we feel neutral or indifferent. We don't really like them, we don't really dislike them, but we don't have any strong feelings either way. So they're, yeah, just kind of neutral. So mentally, we don't do this consciously or deliberately, but just it's our habit as human beings and animals are the same way. <laughs> they have their friends and their enemies and, and so on. Um, so it's just a, a part of our mind as unenlightened beings. We're not enlightened beings, we're not Buddhas. So this is one of our tendencies is to put people in these different categories. Those we like, those we don't like, and those we are indifferent to. And then we treat them differently. Yeah, we're really warm and friendly to our friends, our family, our loved ones. And we may be very 
unfriendly or maybe even nasty to the enemies, the ones we don't like. And then towards everyone else, we just, you know, we don't show any feelings almost it's almost as if they're not even human beings they're not even living beings they're they're just like telephone poles or fire hydrants or something <laughs> not, just not caring about them at all so so it's good to look at this to this is how we are this is our way of being and ask ourselves is this the way i want to be is this a good way to be and there is an alternative the Buddhas, the Bodhisattvas, the spiritual practitioners, those who are really training their minds, developing their minds, develop equanimity. So equanimity means treating everybody with equal respect, seeing everybody as deserving of our respect, our kindness, our compassion, our you know, wish to help. So that's the meaning of equanimity. So sometimes people may think that equanimity means treating everybody the same in the sense of being indifferent. You know, just kind of having an indifference towards everybody. It's not like that. It's actually, we, we do develop warmth, kindness, compassion, very, very positive feelings. And then we extend those positive feelings to everyone. So again, the Dalai Lama is a good example of that. You know, he's often with huge crowds of people. Yeah, and and uh, and he, he's smiling at everybody. He's showing warmth and kindness towards everybody, from little children to adults to elderly people to animals, and so on and so forth. Yeah, so that's. That's the meaning of equanimity. It's not easy to do, but it's something we can work on gradually. And, and again, one of the best ways of working on that is by overcoming our anger, our attachment, our, our anger, our hatred, you know, the negative feelings that we have towards some people and beings and try to reduce those feelings and also attachment attachment uh, which is what we feel towards you know our family and our friends attachment is usually self-centered it's good to recognize the difference between attachment and love they're not the same thing uh, one of the best descriptions of the difference between attachment and love is that um Love, genuine love, is more about the other person. I care about you. I want you to be happy. I want to do what's good for you. So it's more focused on the other person. Whereas attachment is more about me. I want you to be there because you make me happy. You make me feel good. You fulfill my wishes and my needs. So it's almost like we're using the other person for our own sake, for our own benefit. So it's more about me, not about the other person. So that's a good way of differentiating love and attachment. And we all have attachment. We have to be honest about that. And again, it's not a very beautiful, positive state of mind. So if we can recognize when there's attachment coming up in our mind and try to work on that, overcome that, and then try to increase our love, our genuine loving kindness and concern for others, then that's a helpful way of becoming more equanimous. So this is just a brief introduction to this topic. There's a lot more that I could say, but I do wanna leave some time for questions. And in fact, uh, there were already some questions that were sent to me so i'll start with those yes, questions i can i can ask them um be venerable okay um thank you so 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 much um that was a really enlightening informative talk um and i think helped clear up a lot of doubts about the four measurables and confusions and i want to apologize that we can't take uh all questions um today that people may have but i'm hoping that the questions that 
were sent in will help um, you know answer many other of your questions. Um, so one question that was sent in was, how can I develop kindness and compassion towards a partner who does not have the capacity to listen and is constantly seeking information on things that have already been explained? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that sounds like quite a difficult situation. Um, it makes me think also of um, people suffering from Alzheimer's or dementia. There was a woman here just recently who's married to a man and he's suffering from dementia. And so she's observing his cognitive abilities de degenerating. He's only 59, but he's already starting to have symptoms like forgetting things. So I think people who are living with uh, such a person suffering from dementia have this this kind of problem that the person just forgets. Um, so if you I don't know, I, I haven't really had this experience myself. But it, it obviously is very challenging to patients uh, to being patient. And so again, Buddhism has a lot of methods on how to be more patient, uh, how to overcome anger and impatience. So um, there's a book by the Dalai Lama called Healing Anger. So that would be a good one to look at for uh, remedies, antidotes to anger and impatience. So just try your best to be patient. Maybe you could also try to find some other means other methods like when you do explain something to the other person record it <laughs> you know, have a tape recorder have a um, some kind of recording device there and then you can play it back to the person to see well look you know this is what I explained to you yesterday <laughs> I don't know if that would work or not but that's just something that popped up into my mind um, and yeah, maybe just having a talk with them and pointing, getting, trying to get them recognize that their their listening abilities are not very well developed, and they need to work on that. And maybe try to find some resources to help the person, um, the, you know, develop that ability to listen better and remember the things that they have already heard, so that they don't forget. So those are just the things that come in my mind, but yeah, but yeah, compassion, because it's, you know, it's probably a cause of suffering for the other person that they have this problem. And maybe it's not deliberate, like in the case of someone suffering from Alzheimer's, it's not, they didn't choose to be that way. Yeah, it's just a disease that has, that they've, um, that they've gotten and it's causing their brain cells to degenerate. So it's not really their fault. So if you think about that, then that might help to have more compassion and more kindness. Thank you. Um, so one more question that came in is, what advice would you give to someone who has ongoing physical pain without the relief of medication? I feel this is a challenge that many of us will face. Yes. Yeah, I think it's part of our human condition that we are subject to sickness, aging, pain as our body gets older. I'm experiencing that myself now. And then there's more, uh, more things going wrong in the body, more aches and pains in the body. So it is definitely part of this situation we're in as human beings and unenlightened beings and actually buddhism does have a lot of methods for working with pain such as mindfulness you've probably heard um, like the work of john kabat zinn um, bringing mindfulness practice into medicine and teaching mindfulness to people suffering from chronic pain um, so they developed this whole program called Mindfulness Based Stress Reduction, MBSR, I think. So there's programs all over the world um, for teaching people mindfulness to deal with pain. And it can be helpful. I don't know if it's helpful in every case, but it definitely does help people. And then in our tradition, the Tibetan tradition, we have also practices like compassion. When you yourself have pain, 
you can contemplate, you know, I'm not the only person in the world who has pain. Other people have pain too. And then there's this practice of tonglen or um, taking and giving where you, um, like a simple way of doing it is to just think by my experiencing this pain, may the pain and suffering of all other beings be relieved. May they become free of their pain. And so you use your own suffering, your own difficulty to connect with others, feel compassion for them, wish them to be free of their pain. So if you can look for more information about Tonglen, for example, Lama Zopar Rinpoche's book called Transforming Problems, I think, Transforming Problems, Transforming Suffering into Happiness. There's a lot of methods in there on how to, you know, use suffering in the path, in part of our path, part of our practice for enlightenment. Thank you. And um, related to the four measurables directly, um, how do we find the balance between self-compassion and compassion for others? Sometimes compassion feels overwhelming, so I shift to self-compassion, but I don't want to get stuck in just that. And one related question is, how can we differentiate between self-directed loving kindness and self-cherishing? I didn't understand the last bit. Uh, one yeah, related question is, how can we differentiate between self-directed loving kindness, so loving kindness towards oneself, and self-cherishing? Uh, yeah, this is a big issue yeah so um compassion and love are feelings that ideally we have for everybody including oneself so we shouldn't leave ourselves out of um these 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 qualities um and in fact it you know it's said and i think it's true that if if we don't have love and compassion for ourselves that will be a hindrance an obstacle to being able to feel love and compassion for others because if we don't love ourselves it's probably because we're judging ourselves harshly we see things in ourselves we don't like and so we're kind of you know beating ourselves up about those things and so then if we do that we're, we'll do it to others as well when we see those same faults the same qualities that we don't like and others will have the same attitude towards them as we have towards ourselves. So we do need to learn self acceptance, self love, self compassion, to fully have love and compassion for others. But of course, this is something that takes time, it's not going to happen overnight, but we at least have to be aware of working on it. So in some ways of um, meditating on loving kindness and compassion, it's recommended that you go through different individuals. You can start with yourself and then friends and, you know, strangers, enemies, or you can start with others and then put yourself last. So you, there's different ways of doing it, but you do need to include yourself when you're cultivating compassion and love. Um, so saying that, yeah, sometimes compassion feels overwhelming. Yeah, because there's so many other beings and there's so much suffering out there that we start, when we start opening up to that and being aware of that, it can feel overwhelming. You can feel overwhelmed by the amount of suffering. And, and so it is important if you notice that your, your compassion for yourself is decreasing, you might for example, start beating yourself up and thinking, oh, I'm such a lousy practitioner. I should be able to love all beings. I should have compassion for all living beings. I should save all living beings. So you might get into beating yourself up, which is not being self-compassionate. So we do need to, you know, then turn our attention to ourselves and be kind to ourselves and recognize, well, I'm just an ordinary being. I'm not a Buddha yet. I want to be a Buddha one day, but I'm not there yet. So I, you know, I do need to be kind to myself and patient with myself and not beat myself up. So I think it just depends on what's happening in your mind at any given moment that you would focus more on compassion for others or compassion for oneself. 
Um, so it's fine to shift back and forth. Listen, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, and yeah, don't don't get stuck in only having compassion for yourself and not having it for others. So it's good to move back and forth. And then as for the question about the difference between um, loving kindness for yourself and and self cherishing, self cherishing is mainly um, caring more about yourself than others or caring exclusively about yourself, you know, <laughs> the, the extreme form is, I don't care about anybody else, I only care about me. And others are there only to make me happy. So that's like the extreme form of, of self cherishing. Um, so we want to move away from that and gradually become more altruistic, more focused on others. Um, but again, that doesn't mean neglecting ourselves. Some of the Tibetan teachings, some of the traditional teachings in the Tibetan tradition almost sound like we should uh, neglect ourselves and not care about ourselves and not be kind to ourselves. It can sound like that, but the Dalai Lama makes it clear that that isn't the meaning, that we shouldn't neglect or mistreat ourselves. There's a very nice explanation in a book that came out recently. It's called In Praise of Compassion, I think. It's volume five in the series of um, the Library of Wisdom and Compassion, which is by the Dalai Lama and Tupton Chudron. It's a wisdom book. So that book is wonderful. I highly recommend it. It's a must for anyone who wants to have more compassion. So it explains how to develop compassion and love, the four measurables, bodhicitta. And there's a really nice explanation in there about the difference between um, uh, self-love, self-compassion, and self-cherishing. So I don't have time. I don't have the book with me right now to read it. But um, if you want to know more about that, then that's a good resource. <clears throat> Thank you. So I think we can maybe move to the meditation. Okay, let's do some meditation. I've been talking a lot, giving a lot of different ideas. So let's do a little bit of meditation to try to integrate some of these ideas in our mind and our heart. So start by making yourselves comfortable. Um, Whatever way you're sitting, whether you're sitting in a chair or you're sitting with your legs crossed, try to keep your back straight. That's very helpful to stay awake, alert, focused. <clears throat> but at the same time, be relaxed. Try to let go of any tension you may have anywhere in your body. Imagine it melting and flowing out of you, going down into the earth, disappearing there. Let your breathing be natural. Just for a few moments, be aware of your breathing. Coming in, going out. Let your mind settle down in the present, present moment right now, present place, wherever you are. Put aside all other thoughts, worries, plans. Just put them aside for now and just let your awareness be in the present.
Now, I'd like you to bring to mind someone you love, someone you care about. But better not to think of someone you have romantic feelings or sexual desire for, more the sort of unconditional kind of love that you feel for your mother or your sister, your brother, your child, or a pet. Warm hearted, caring feelings. So bring to mind someone towards whom you have those kind of feelings naturally, spontaneously. And you can have a mental image of that person. Imagine them right in front of you right now. And let those warm, caring feelings come up in your mind, in your heart. Recognize how you want this person to be happy. You want them to not suffer. If they do suffer, you're really touched, really moved, really concerned, and you want to do what you can to relieve their suffering, and restore them to a state of well-being and happiness. So those are the feelings we're talking about here, kindness and compassion. We have those feelings just naturally, but they're not always there. But we can increase those feelings so we do feel them more often and for more people. So now bring to mind another person, this time someone you don't know very well it could be a total stranger, someone you just meet in the street, or a neighbor you don't know very well, shopkeeper, someone you buy vegetables from. I think of someone like that and imagine that person in front of you. And think of them next to the first person. <clears throat> and I think this is another human being, just like me and just like the first person I thought about. They too want happiness and they don't want suffering or problems. And see if you can generate kindness and compassion for this person, thinking how nice it would be if they can be happy. I wish them to be happy. I wish them to not experience suffering, pain or problems. Now let's try to do the same with a difficult person. <clears throat> Not your worst enemy, but just someone you find annoying, difficult to like. So again, it could be someone in your family or in your neighborhood. So think of such a person and imagine them in front of you next to the others. And again, contemplate that this is another human being, just like me and the other two. 
They have mind, thoughts, feelings, and they wish happiness, they wish to have good experiences, and they wish to not experience any suffering or problems or pain. It's also helpful to understand that the reason <clears throat> they behave the way they do that you find annoying is probably because they are unhappy. They're not really happy. And if they could be more happy, then you might be able to get along with them better. So see if you can generate that feeling in your mind, in your heart. Or even just say the words to yourself, may you be happy, may you be free of suffering and problems. Now open your mind, your heart, and extend those same feelings of kindness and compassion <clears throat> to all beings everywhere. You can imagine them in the form of light going out in all directions and reaching all beings, wishing all beings to be happy, to have their needs and wishes fulfilled. <clears throat> Wishing all beings to be free of suffering and pain and problems. So we're now at the end of our time together and <clears throat> we can take a few moments to dedicate the positive energy. So we've, <clears throat> we've definitely generated merit or positive energy during this time, focusing on this beautiful topic of kindness and compassion, thinking about it, generating it. So may this positive energy be shared by all living beings. May it be the cause for all beings everywhere to be free of suffering and the causes of suffering, to have happiness and the causes of happiness, and to get closer to enlightenment, their potential to be totally free, totally pure and positive, totally enlightened. <clears throat> <clears throat> okay, so thank you for giving me this opportunity to give this talk. I hope it's been helpful for all of you. Nice to connect with you again. <clears throat> thank you so much, Venerable. And um, yeah, we would also like to dedicate to uh, your Abbey, Shavasti Abbey, and all the nuns there. It's flourishing and uh the well-being of all the nuns there um yes thank you so much and we hope to see you here at Tushita Delhi maybe sometime in the future um and I'll just hand it to Renuka Ji if she would like to have any closing words no we are very grateful venerable Sangeet Kadrala for accepting to give this talk on kindness and compassion and uh, I hope uh, we can translate all this into our lives, at least a fraction of it. So thank you very much for your inspiration.
and the life that you're leaving. And please come back to Tuchita soon. <laughs> okay, I will Thank try. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Bye. <clears throat>